Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter One. Read by M. B. Jonathan Harker's Journal. Three May. Bistritz. Left Munich at eight thirty five p. m. on first May. Arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at six forty six, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place from the glimpse which I got of it from the train and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, as we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east. The most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time, and came after nightfall to Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royale. I had for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. Mem, get recipe from Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called Paprika Hendel, and that, as it was a national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere along the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when in London, I had visited the British Museum, and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with the noblemen of that country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia, and Bukovina, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map or work giving the exact locality of the castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own ordnance survey maps, but I found that Bistritz, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania there are four distinct nationalities, Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magyars in the west, and Sukes in the east and north. I am going among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the eleventh century they found the Huns settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the centre of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Mem, I must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe and was still thirsty. Towards morning I slept and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika and a sort of porridge of maize flour which they said was mamaliga, and eggplant stuffed with forcemeat, a very excellent dish which they call implatata. Ma'am, get recipe for this also. I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight, or rather it ought to have done so, for after rushing to the station at seven-thirty I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be in China? All day long we seemed to dawdle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. 
it takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear at every station there were groups of people sometimes crowds and in all sorts of attire some of them were just like the peasants at home or those i saw coming through france and germany with short jackets and round hats and home-made trousers but others were very picturesque the women looked pretty except when you got near them but they were very clumsy about the waist they had all full white sleeves of some kind or other and most of them had big belts with a lot of strips of something fluttering from them like the dresses in a ballet but of course there were petticoats under them the strangest figures we saw were the slovaks who were more barbarian than the rest with their big cowboy hats great baggy dirty white trousers white linen shirts and enormous heavy leather belts nearly a foot wide all studded over with brass nails they wore high boots with their trousers tucked into them and had long black hair and heavy black moustaches they are very picturesque but do not look prepossessing on the stage they would be set down at once as some sort of old oriental band of brigands they are however i am told very harmless and rather wanting in natural self-assertion it was on the dark side of twilight when we got to bistritz which is a very interesting old place being practically on the frontier for the borgo pass leads from it into bukovina it has had a very stormy existence and it certainly shows marks of it fifty years ago a series of great fires took place which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions at the very beginning of the seventeenth century it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost thirteen thousand people the casualties of war proper being assisted by famine and disease count dracula had directed me to go to the golden crone hotel which i found to my great delight to be thoroughly old-fashioned for of course i wanted to see all i could of the ways of the country i was evidently expected for when i got near the door i faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress white undergarment with a long double apron front and back of coloured stuff fitting almost too tight for modesty when i came close she bowed and said the herr englishman yes i said jonathan harker she smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt-sleeves who had followed her to the door he went but immediately returned with a letter my friend welcome to the carpathians i am anxiously expecting you sleep well to-night at three to-morrow the diligence will start for bukovina a place on it is kept for you at the borgo pass my carriage will await you and will bring you to me i trust that your journey from london has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land your friend dracula five may the castle the grey of the morning has passed and the sun is high over the distant horizon which seems jagged whether with trees or hills i know not for it is so far off that big things and little are mixed i am not sleepy and as i am not to be called till i awake naturally i write till sleep comes there are many odd things to put down and lest who reads them may fancy that i dined too well before i left bizritz let me put down my dinner exactly i dined on what they call robber steak bits of bacon onion and beef seasoned with red pepper and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire in simple style of the london cat's meat the wine was golden mediache which produces a queer sting on the tongue which is however not disagreeable i had only a couple of glasses of this and nothing else when i got on the coach the driver had not taken his seat and i saw him talking to the landlady they were evidently talking of me for every now and then they looked at me and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door came and listened and then looked at me most of them pityingly i could hear a lot of words often repeated queer words 
for there were many nationalities in the crowd, so I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say they were not cheering for me, for amongst them were Ore Dog, Satan, Pokol, Hell, Stragoica, Witch, Vrolok, and Vulkozlak, both mean the same thing, one being Slovak and the other Servian, for something that is either werewolf or vampire. Ma'am, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man, but everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn-yard and its crowd of picturesque figures all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway, with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange trees and green tubs clustered in the centre of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, Goza, they call them, cracked his big whip over his four small horses which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears in the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although had I known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills, crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom. Apple, plum, pear, cherry. As we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spangled with the fallen petals. In and out among these green hills of what they call here the Middle Land ran the road, losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand, then, what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borgo Prund. I was told that this road is in summer time excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect it is different from the general run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of old the hospodars would not repair them lest the Turk should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war, which was always really at loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the Middle Land, rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing out all the glorious colours of the beautiful range, deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags, till these were themselves lost in the distance where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look! East and sec, God's seat, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. This was emphasized by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset 
and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that goiter was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn round as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me. For instance, hayricks in the trees, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a lighter wagon, the ordinary peasant's cart, with its long snake-like vertebra calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their coloured sheepskins, the latter carrying lance fashion their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell it began to get very cold and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness the gloom of the trees, oak, beech, and pine, though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hills as we ascended through the pass the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us, great masses of greyness which here and there bestrewed the trees produced a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies engendered earlier in the evening when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds which amongst the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce, and then he added, with what he evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest, and you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip, and with wild cries of encouragement urged them on to further exertions. Then through the darkness I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs, and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level, and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side, and to frown down upon us. We were entering on the Borgo Pass. One by one several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with an earnestness which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith with a kindly word and a blessing, and that same strange mixture of fear-meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Bistritz, the sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then, as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected, but though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. This state of excitement kept on for some little time. At last we saw before us the pass opening out on the eastern side. There were dark rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres, and that now we had got into the thunderous one. 
I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which the steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now the sandy road lying white before us, but there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone. I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then, turning to me, he spoke in German worse than my own. There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina and return to-morrow, or the next day, better the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a calèche with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them that the horses were coal-black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned to us. He said to the driver, "'You are early to-night, my friend.' The man stammered in reply, "'The English hare was in a hurry.' To which the stranger replied, "'That is why, I suppose, you wished him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift.' As he spoke, he smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another the line from Berger's Lenora, Den die Toten reiten schnell, for the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away, at the same time putting out his two fingers and crossing himself. "'Give me the hare's luggage,' said the driver, and with exceeding alacrity my bags were handed out and put in the calèche. Then I descended from the side of the coach. As the calèche was close alongside, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel, his strength must have been prodigious. Without a word he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach by the light of the lamps, and projected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to the horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill and a lonely feeling come over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders, and a rug across my knees, and the driver said, in excellent German, "'The night is chill, mein Herr, and my master the Count bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Slivovitz, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same. I felt a little strangely, and not a little frightened.' I think had there been any alternative I should have taken it, instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along, then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again, and so I took note of some salient point and found that this was so. I would have liked to have asked the driver what this all meant but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have had no effect, in case there had been an intention to delay. By and by, however, 
as i was curious to know how time was passing i struck a match and by its flame looked at my watch it was within a few minutes of midnight this gave me a sort of shock for i suppose the general supposition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences i waited with a sick feeling of suspense then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road a long agonized wailing as if from fear the sound was taken up by another dog and then another and another till borne on the wind which now sighed softly through the pass a wild howling began which seemed to come from all over the country as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night at the first howl the horses began to strain and rear but the driver spoke to them soothingly and they quieted down but shivered and sweated as though after a runaway from sudden fright then far off in the distance from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and a sharper howling that of wolves which affected both the horses and myself in the same way for i was minded to jump from the calash and run whilst they reared again and plunged madly so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting in a few minutes however my own ears got accustomed to the sound and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them he petted and soothed them and whispered something in their ears as i have heard of horse tamers doing and with extraordinary effect for under his caresses they became quite manageable again though they still trembled the driver again took his seat and shaking his reins started off at a great pace this time after going to the far side of the pass he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway which ran sharply to the right soon we were hemmed in with trees which in places arched right over the roadway till we passed as through a tunnel and again great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side though we were in shelter we could hear the rising wind for it moaned and whistled through the rocks and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along it grew colder and colder still and fine powdery snow began to fall so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket the keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs though this grew fainter as we went on our way the baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer as though they were closing round on us from every side i grew dreadfully afraid and the horses shared my fear the driver however was not in the least disturbed he kept turning his head to left and right but i could not see anything through the darkness suddenly away on our left i saw a faint flickering blue flame the driver saw it at the same moment he at once checked the horses and jumping to the ground disappeared into the darkness i did not know what to do the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer but while i wondered the driver suddenly appeared again and without a word took his seat and we resumed our journey i think i must have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of the incident for it seemed to be repeated endlessly and now looking back it is like a sort of awful nightmare once the flame appeared so near the road that even in the darkness around us i could watch the driver's motions he went rapidly to where the blue flame arose it must have been very faint for it did not seem to illuminate the place around it at all and gathering a few stones formed them into some device once there appeared a strange optical effect when he stood between me and the flame he did not obstruct it for i could see its ghostly flicker all the same this startled me but as the effect was only momentary i took it that my eyes deceived me straining through the darkness then for a time there were no blue flames and we sped onwards through the gloom with the howling of the wolves around us as though they were following in a moving circle at last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet gone and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever and to snort and scream with fright 
i could not see any cause for it for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether but just then the moon sailing through the black clouds appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock and by its light i saw around us a ring of wolves with white teeth and lolling red tongues with long sinewy limbs and shaggy hair they were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than even when they howled for myself i felt a sort of paralysis of fear it is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import all at once the wolves began to howl as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them the horses jumped about and reared and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see but the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side and they had perforce to remain within it i called to the coachman to come for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break out through the ring and to aid his approach i shouted and beat the side of the caleche hoping by the noise to scare the wolves from the side so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap how he came there i know not but i heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command and looking towards the sound saw him standing in the roadway as he swept his long arms as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle the wolves fell back and back further still just then a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon so that we were again in darkness when i could see again the driver was climbing into the caleche and the wolves disappeared this was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me and i was afraid to speak or move the time seemed interminable as we swept on our way now in almost complete darkness for the rolling clouds obscured the moon we kept on ascending with occasional periods of quick descent but in the main always ascending suddenly i became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle from whose tall black windows came no ray of light and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky chapter two read by m b jonathan harker's journal five may i must have been asleep for certainly if i had been awake i must have noticed the approach of such a remarkable place in the gloom the courtyard looked of considerable size and as several dark ways led from it under great round arches it perhaps seemed bigger than it really is i have not yet been able to see it by daylight when the caleche stopped the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight again i could not but notice his prodigious strength his hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if it had chosen then he took my traps and placed them on the ground beside me as i stood close to a great door old and studded with large iron nails and set in a projecting doorway of massive stone i could see even in the dim light that the stone was massively carved but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather as i stood the driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins the horses started forward and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings i stood in silence where i was for i did not know what to do of bell or knocker there was no sign through these frowning walls and dark window openings it was not likely that my voice could penetrate the time i waited seemed endless and i felt doubts and fears crowding upon me what sort of place had i come to and among what kind of people what sort of grim adventure was it on which i had embarked was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's clerk sent out to explain the purchase of a london estate to a foreigner solicitor's clerk mina would not like that solicitor 
for just before leaving london i got word that my examination was successful and i am now a full-blown solicitor i began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if i were awake it all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me and i expected that i should suddenly awake and find myself at home with the dawn struggling in through the windows as i had now and again felt in the morning after a day of overwork but my flesh answered the pinching test and my eyes were not to be deceived i was indeed awake and among the carpathians all i could do now was to be patient and to wait the coming of morning just as i had come to this conclusion i heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door and saw through the chinks a gleam of a coming light then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back a key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse and the great door swung back within stood a tall old man clean-shaven save for a long white moustache and clad in black from head to foot without a single speck of colour about him anywhere he held in his hand an antique silver lamp in which the flame burned without a chimney or globe of any kind throwing long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door the old man motioned me in with his right hand with a courtly gesture saying in excellent english but with a strange intonation welcome to my house enter freely and of your own free will he made no motion of stepping to meet me but stood like a statue as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone the instant however that i had stepped over the threshold he moved impulsively forward and holding out his hand grasped mine with a strength which made me wince an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed cold as ice more like the hand of a dead than a living man again he said welcome to my house enter freely go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring the strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which i had noticed in the driver whose face i had not seen that for a moment i doubted if it were not the same person to whom i was speaking so to make sure i said interrogatively count dracula he bowed in a courtly way as he replied i am dracula and i bid you welcome mr harker to my house come in the night air is chill and you must need to eat and rest as he was speaking he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall and stepping out took my luggage he had carried it in before i could forestall him i protested but he insisted nay sir you are my guest it is late and my people are not available let me see to your comfort myself he insisted on carrying my traps along the passage and then up a great winding stair and along another great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily at the end of this he threw open a heavy door and i rejoiced to see within a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs freshly replenished flamed and flared the count halted putting down my bags closed the door and crossing the room opened another door which led into a small octagonal room lit by a single lamp and seemingly without a window of any sort passing through this he opened another door and motioned me to enter it was a welcome sight for here was a great bedroom well lighted and warmed with another log fire also added to but lately for the top logs were fresh which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney the count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew saying before he closed the door you will need after your journey to refresh yourself by making your toilet i trust you will find all you wish when you are ready come into the other room where you will find your supper prepared the light and warmth and the count's courteous welcome seem to have dissipated all my doubts and fears having then reached my normal state 
I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So, making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table, and said, I pray you, be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already, and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I must regret that an attack of gout, from which malady I am a constant sufferer, forbids absolutely any travelling on my part for some time to come, but I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute, one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend on you when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish, and I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. This, with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old toquet, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating it the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire had drawn up a chair by the fire and begun to smoke a cigar, which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now an opportunity of observing him, and found him of a very marked physiognomy. His face was a strong, a very strong, aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temples but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale, and the tops extremely pointed, the chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine, but seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse, broad, with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the centre of the palm. The nails were long and fine, and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over me and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back, and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, and as I looked towards the window I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened I heard as if from down below in the valley the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the mind of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and to-morrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon. 
so sleep well and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear, I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. 7 May It is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last twenty-four hours. I slept till late in the day, and awoke of my own accord. When I had dressed myself, I went into the room where we had supped, and found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table, on which was written, I have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are round me. The table service is of gold, and so beautifully wrought, that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics, and must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilet-glass on my table, and I had to get the little shaving-glass from my bag, before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere, or heard a sound near the castle, except the howling of wolves. Sometime after I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it. I looked for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle till I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room book, newspaper, or even writing materials, so I opened another door in the room, and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but found locked. In the library I found, to my great delight, a vast number of English books, whole shelves full of them, and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. A table in the centre was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind, history, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England, and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy Lists, and it somehow gladdened my heart to see it, the law list. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened, and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way, and hoped that I had had a good night's rest. Then he went on. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions, and he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But, Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate, but yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. 
Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that, did I move and speak in your London, none there are who would not know me for a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here I am noble. I am a boyar. The common people know me, and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not, and know not is to care not for. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he sees me, or pauses in speaking if he hears my words. Aha! A stranger! I have been so long alone, that I would be master still, or at least that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone as an agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of Exeter, to tell me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest with me here a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation. And I would that you would tell me when I make error, even in the smallest, in my speaking. I am sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has many important affairs in hand. Of course, I said all I could about being willing, and asked if I might come into that room when I chose. He answered, Yes, certainly, and added, You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are, and did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this, and then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversation, as it was evident that he wanted to talk if only for talking's sake. I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me or come within my notice. Sometimes he sheared off the subject, or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand, but generally he answered all I asked most frankly. Then, as time went on, and I had got somewhat bolder, I asked him of the strange things of the preceding night, as, for instance, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue flames. Then he explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night, in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, a blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which you came last night. There can be but little doubt, for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Wallachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots or invaders. In the old days there were stirring times when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes, and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the children too and waited their coming on the rocks above the passes, that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant he found but little, for whatever there was has been sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, said I, can it have remained so long undiscovered, when there is a sure index to it if men will but take the trouble to look? The Count smiled and as his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp, canine teeth showed out strangely. He answered, Because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And, dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasant that you tell me of, who marked the place of the flame, would not know where to look in daylight, even for his own work. Even you would not, I dare be sworn, be able to find these places again. There, you are right, I said. 
I know no more than the dead where even to look for them. Then we drifted into other matters. Come, he said at last, tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room, and as I passed through, noticed that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading, of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's guide. When I came in he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into the plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything, and asked me a myriad questions about the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighbourhood, for he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well, but my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there I shall be all alone, and my friend Harker Jonathan, uh, nay, pardon me, I fall into my country's habit of putting your patronymic first, my friend Jonathan Harker will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away, probably working at papers of the law with my other friend Peter Hawkins. So we went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Purfleet. When I had told him the facts and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter with them ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes which I had made at the time, and which I inscribe here. At Purfleet, on a by-road, I came across just such a place as seemed to be required, and where was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It was surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure built of heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates are of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old Catfas, as the house is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some twenty acres quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it, which make it in places gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in a fair-sized stream. The house is very large, and of all periods back, I should say, to medieval times for one part is of stone immensely thick, with only a few windows high up, heavily barred with iron. It looks like part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, for I had not the key of the door leading to it from the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house had been added to, but in a very straggling way and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses at hand, one being a very large house, only recently added to, and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day, and after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may lie amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters, which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken. The shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. 
I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. Somehow his words and his look did not seem to accord, or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with an excuse, he left me, asking me to pull my papers together. He was some little time away, and I began to look at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found opened naturally to England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it I found in certain places little rings marked, and on examining these I noticed that one was near London on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated. The other two were Exeter and Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. It was the better part of an hour when the Count returned. Aha, he said, still at your books? Good, but you must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm, and we went into the next room, where I found an excellent supper ready on the table. The Count again excused himself, as he had dined on his being away from home. But he sat as on the previous night, and chatted whilst I ate. After supper I smoked as on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy, as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of the dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the changed dawn, or at the turn of the tide. Any one who has, when tired, and tied, as it were, to his post, experienced this change in the atmosphere, can well believe it. All at once we heard the crow of the cock, coming up with preternatural shrillness through the clear morning air. Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, Why, there is morning again! How remiss I am to let you stay up so long! You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England less interesting, so that I may not forget how time flies by us. And with a courtly bow, he quickly left me. I went into my room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. My window opened into the courtyard. All I could see was the warm grey of quickening sky. So I pulled the curtains again, and have written of this day. 8 May I began to fear, as I wrote in this book, that I was getting too diffuse. But now... I am glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it, or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night existence is telling on me, but would that that were all. If there were any one to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with, and he. I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic so far as facts can be. It will help me to bear up, and imagination must not run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving-glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder, and heard the Count's voice saying to me, "'Good morning.' I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error, for the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder. 
but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it except myself. This was startling, and coming on top of so many strange things was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the Count is near. But at the instant I saw that the cut had bled a little and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round, to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe it was ever there. "'Take care,' he said. "'Take care how you cut yourself. "'It is more dangerous than you think in this country.' "'Then, seizing the shaving-glass, he went on, "'And this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. "'It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. "'Away with it!' "'And opening the window with one wrench of his terrible hand, "'he flung out the glass, "'which was shattered into a thousand pieces "'on the stones of the courtyard far below.' Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave unless in my watch-case or the bottom of the shaving-pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining-room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrific precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green tree-tops, with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place save from the windows in the castle walls is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. Chapter 3 Read by M.B. Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find, but, after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only am I certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and doubtless has his own motives for it, would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived, like a baby, by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits, and if the latter be so, I need and shall need all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut, and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had thought all along, that there are no servants in the house. 
when later i saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door laying the table in the dining-room i was assured of it for if he does himself all these menial offices surely it is proof that there is no one else in the castle it must have been the count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here this is a terrible thought for if so what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did by only holding up his hand for silence how was it that all the people at bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me what meant the giving of the crucifix of the garlic of the wild rose of the mountain ash bless that good good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever i touch it it is odd that a thing which i have been taught to regard with disfavour and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself or that it is a medium a tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort some time if it may be i must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it in the meantime i must find out all i can about count dracula as it may help me to understand to-night he may talk of himself if i turn the conversation that way i must be very careful however not to awake his suspicion midnight i have had a long talk with the count i asked him a few questions on transylvania history and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully in his speaking of things and people and especially of battles he spoke as if he'd been present at them all this he afterwards explained by saying that to a boyar the pride of his house and name is his own pride that their glory is his glory that their fate is his fate whenever he spoke of his house he always said we and spoke almost in the plural like a king speaking i wish i could have put down all he said exactly as he said it for to me it was most fascinating it seemed to have in it a whole history of the country he grew excited as he spoke and walked about the room pulling his great white moustache and grasping anything on which he laid his hands as though it would crush him by main strength one thing he said which i shall put down as nearly as i can for it tells in its way the story of his race. We Sakes have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, ay, and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here, too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches who, expelled from Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert fools fools what devil or what witch was ever so great as attila whose blood is in these veins he held up his arms is it a wonder that we are a conquering race that we were proud that when the magyar the lombard the avar the bulgar or the turk poured his thousands on our frontiers we drove them back is it strange that when Arpad and his legion swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Honfoglalas was completed there, and when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Sakelis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkeyland? Aye, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for as the turks say water sleeps and the enemy is sleepless who more gladly than we throughout the four nations received the bloody sword or at its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king when was proclaimed that great shame of my nation the shame of kosova when the flags of the wallach and the magyar went down beneath the crescent 
who was it but one of my own race who has voivode crossed the danube and beat the turk on his own ground this was a dracula indeed woe was it that his own unworthy brother when he had fallen sowed his people to the turk and brought the shame of slavery on them was it not this dracula indeed who inspired that other of his race who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into turkeyland who when he was beaten back came again and again though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph they said that he thought only of himself bah what good are peasants without a leader where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it again when after the battle of mohax we threw off the hungarian yoke we of the dracula blood were amongst their leaders for our spirit would not brook that we were not free ah young sir the Sakes and the Dracula, as their heart's blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record that mushroom growths like the Habsburgs and the Romanoffs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Mem. This diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at cockcrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12. May Let me begin with facts, bare, meagre facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation, or my memory of them last evening when the count came from his room he began by asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business i had to spend the day wearily over books and simply to keep my mind occupied went over some of the matters i had been examined in at lincoln's inn there was a certain method in the count's inquiries so i shall try to put them down in sequence the knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that to change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking, and another to look after shipping, in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked to explain more fully, so that I might not by any chance mislead him, so he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now, here, let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London, instead of someone resident there, that my motive was that no local interest might be served save my wish only and as one of London residents might perhaps have some purpose of himself or friend to serve, I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now, suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods, say to Newcastle or Durham or Harwich or Dover, might it not be that it could with more ease be done by consigning to one in those ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business, 
who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments and the forms to be gone through, and all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, "'Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other?' It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. "'Then write now, my young friend,' he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder. "'Write to our friend, and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long?' I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much, nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and that, if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, restless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them, is it not so? As he spoke he handed me three sheets of note-paper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, then at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp, canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be more careful what I wrote for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only three formal notes now, but to write to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write shorthand which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters I sat quiet, reading a book whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring as he wrote them to some books on his table. Then he took up my two and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for, under the circumstances, I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, The Crescent, Whitby another to Herr Leutner, Varner, the third was to Coots and Company, London, and the fourth to Heron Klopstock and Billroyd, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door-handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to resume my book, before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and then turning to me, said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. At the door he turned, and after a moment's pause said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned, should sleep now or ever overcome you, 
or be like to do then haste to your own chamber or these rooms for your rest will then be safe but if you be not careful in this respect then he finished his speech in a gruesome way for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them i quite understood my only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing around me later i endorse the last words written but this time there is no doubt in question i shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not i have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed i imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams and there it shall remain when he left me i went to my room after a little while not hearing any sound i came out and went up the vast stone stair to where i could look out towards the south there was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse inaccessible though it was to me as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard looking out on this i felt that i was indeed in prison and i seemed to want a breath of fresh air though it were of the night i am now beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me it is destroying my nerve i start at my own shadow and am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings god knows that there is ground for my terrible fear in this accursed place i looked out over the beautiful expanse bathed in soft yellow moonlight till it was almost as light as day in the soft light the distant hills became melted and the shadows in the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness the mere beauty seemed to cheer me there was peace and comfort in every breath i drew as i leaned from the window my eye was caught by something moving a story below me and somewhat to my left where i imagined from the order of the rooms that the windows of the count's own room would look out the window at which i stood was tall and deep stone mullioned and though weather-worn was still complete but it was evidently many a day since the case had been there i drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out what i saw was the count's head coming out from the window i did not see the face but i knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms in any case i could not mistake the hands which i had had some many opportunities of studying i was at first interested and somewhat amused for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner but my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when i saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings at first i could not believe my eyes i thought it was some trick of the moonlight some weird effect of shadow but i kept looking and it could be no delusion i saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years and by thus using every projection and inequality move downwards with considerable speed just as a lizard moves along a wall what manner of man is this or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of man i feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me i am in fear in awful fear and there is no escape for me i am encompassed with terrors that i dare not think of fifteen may once more i have seen the count go out in his lizard fashion he moved downwards in a sidelong way some hundred feet down and a good deal to the left he vanished into some hole or window when his head had disappeared i leaned out to try and see more but without avail the distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight i knew he had left the castle now and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than i had dared to do as yet i went back to the room and taking a lamp tried all the doors they were all locked as i had expected and the locks were comparatively new but i went down the stone stairs to the hall where i had entered originally i found i could pull back the bolts easily enough and unhook the great chains 
but the door was locked and the key was gone that key must be in the count's room i must watch should this door be unlocked so that i may get it and escape i went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them one or two small rooms near the hall were open but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture dusty with age and moth-eaten at last however i found one door at the top of the stairway which though it seemed locked gave a little under pressure i tried it harder and found that it was not really locked but that the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had fallen somewhat and the heavy door rested on the floor here was an opportunity which i might not have again so i exerted myself and with my many efforts forced it back so that i could enter i was now in a wing of the castle further to the right than the rooms i knew and a story lower down from the windows i could see that the suite of rooms lay along to the south of the castle the windows of the end room looking out both west and south on the latter side as well as to the former there was a great precipice the castle was built on the corner of a great rock so that on three sides it was quite impregnable and great windows were placed here where sling or bow or culverin could not reach and consequently light and comfort impossible to a position which had to be guarded were secured to the west was a great valley and then rising far away great jagged mountain fastnesses rising peak on peak the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone this was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days for the furniture had more an air of comfort than any i had seen the windows were curtainless and the yellow moonlight flooding in through the diamond panes enabled one to see colours whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and moth my lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight but i was glad to have it with me for there was a dread loneliness in the place which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble still it was better than living alone in the rooms which i had come to hate from the presence of the count and after trying a little to school my nerves i found a soft quietude come over me here i am sitting at a little oak table where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen with much thought and many blushes her ill-spelt love-letter and writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since i closed it last it is the nineteenth century up to date with a vengeance and yet unless my senses deceive me the old centuries had and have powers of their own which mere modernity cannot kill later the morning of sixteen may god preserve my sanity for to this i am reduced safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past whilst i live on here there is but one thing to hope for that i may not go mad if indeed i be not mad already if i be sane then surely it is maddening to think that of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place the count is the least dreadful to me that to him alone i can look for safety even though this may be only whilst i can serve his purpose great god merciful god let me be calm for out of that way lies madness indeed i begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me up to now i never knew quite what shakespeare meant when he made hamlet say my tablets quick my tablets tis meet that i put it down etc for now feeling as though my own brain were unhinged or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing i turn to my diary for repose the habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me it frightens me more not when i think of it for in the future he has a frightful hold upon me i shall fear to doubt what he may say 
when i had written in my diary and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket i felt sleepy the count's warning came into my mind but i took pleasure in disobeying it the sense of sleep was upon me and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider the soft moonlight soothed and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me i determined not to return to-night to the gloom haunted rooms but to sleep here where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk away in the midst of remorseless wars i drew a great couch out of its place near the corner so that as i lay i could look at the lovely view to east and south and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust composed myself for sleep i suppose i must have fallen asleep i hope so but i fear for all that followed was startlingly real so real that now sitting here in the broad full sunlight of the morning i cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep i was not alone the room was the same unchanged in any way since i came into it i could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight my own footsteps marked where i had disturbed the long accumulation of dust in the moonlight opposite me were three young women ladies by their dress and manner i thought at the time that i must be dreaming when i saw them they threw no shadow on the floor they came close to me and looked at me for some time and then whispered together Three were dark and had high aquiline noses like the Count, and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed, such a silvery musical laugh, as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable tingling sweetness of water-glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, "'Go on. You are first, and we shall follow.' yours is the right to begin the other added he is young and strong there are kisses for us all i lay quiet looking out from under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation the fair girl advanced and bent over me till i could feel the movement of her breath upon me sweet it was in one sense honey sweet and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice but with a bitter underlying sweet a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. Then she paused, and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips, and I could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat, and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. 
I closed my eyes in languorous ecstasy, and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count, and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman, and with giant's power draw it back, the blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count! Never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was as lurid as if the flames of hell-fire blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were like hard-drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm he hurled the woman from him, and then motioned to the others as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture that I had seen used to the wolves. In a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring in the room, he said, "'How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast your eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all! This man belongs to me! Beware how you meddle with him, or you'll have to deal with me!' The fair girl, with a laugh of ribald coquetry, turned to answer him, "'You yourself have never loved. You never love.' On this the other women joined, and such a merciless, hard, soulless laughter rang throughout the room that it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the Count turned, after looking at my face attentively, and said in a soft whisper, Yes, I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go. I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing to-night? said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there were some living thing within it. For answer he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. My ears did not deceive me. There was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round while I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down unconscious. Chapter 4 Read by M.B. Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before going to bed and many such details. But these things are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and, for some cause or another, I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad. If it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him, which he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it. As I look round this room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, 
for nothing could be more dreadful than those awful women who were who are waiting to suck my blood eighteen may i have been down to look at that room again in daylight for i must know the truth when i got to the doorway at the top of the stairs i found it closed it had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered i could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot but the door is fastened from the inside i fear it was no dream and must act on this surmise nineteen may i am surely in the toils last night the count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters one saying that my work here was nearly done and that i should start for home within a few days another that i was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter and the third that i had left the castle and arrived at bistritz i would fain have rebelled but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the count whilst i am so absolutely in his power and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger he knows that i know too much and that i must not live lest i be dangerous to him my only chance is to prolong my opportunities something may occur which will give me a chance to escape i saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him he explained to me that posts were few and uncertain and that my writing now would ensure ease of mind to my friends and he assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand the later letters which would be held over at bistritz until due time in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay that to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion i therefore pretended to fall in with his views and asked what dates i should put on the letters he calculated a minute and then said the first should be june twelve the second june nineteen and the third june twenty nine i now know the span of my life god help me twenty eight may there is a chance of escape or at any rate of being able to send word home a band of sagani have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard these are gypsies i have notes of them in my book they are peculiar to this part of the world though allied to the ordinary gypsies all the world over there are thousands of them in hungary and transylvania who are almost outside all law they attach themselves as a rule to some great noble or boyar and call themselves by his name they are fearless and without religion save superstition and they talk only their own varieties of the romany tongue i shall write some letters home and shall try to get them to have them posted i have already spoken to them through my window to begin acquaintanceship they took their hats off and made obeisance and many signs which however i could not understand any more than i could their spoken language i have written the letters mina's is in shorthand and i simply ask mr hawkins to communicate with her to her i have explained my situation but without the horrors which i may only surmise it would shock and frighten her to death were i to expose my heart to her should the letters not carry then the count shall not yet know my secret or the extent of my knowledge i have given the letters i threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs i could to have them posted the man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap i could do no more i stole back to the study and began to read as the count did not come in i have written here the count has come he sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters the sagani has given me these of which though i know not whence they come i shall of course take care see he must have looked at it one is from you and to my friend peter hawkins the other 
here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope and the dark look came into his face and his eyes blazed wickedly the other is a vile thing an outrage upon friendship and hospitality it is not signed well so it cannot matter to us and he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed then he went on the letter to hawkins that i shall of course send on since it is yours your letters are sacred to me your pardon my friend that unknowingly i did break the seal will you not cover it again he held out the letter to me and with a courteous bow handed me a clean envelope i could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence when he went out of the room i could hear the key turned softly a minute later i went over and tried it and the door was locked when an hour or two after the count came quietly into the room his coming awakened me for i had gone to sleep on the sofa he was very courteous and very cheery in his manner and seeing that i had been sleeping he said so my friend you are tired get to bed there is the surest rest i may not have the pleasure of talk to-night since there are many labours to me but you will sleep i pray i passed to my room and went to bed and strange to say slept without dreaming despair has its own calms thirty one may this morning when i woke i thought i would provide myself with some papers and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket so that i might write in case i should get an opportunity but again a surprise again a shock every scrap of paper was gone and with it all my notes my memoranda relating to railways and travel my letter of credit in fact all that might be useful to me were i once outside the castle i sat and pondered a while and then some thought occurred to me and i made search of my portmanteau and in the wardrobe where i had placed my clothes the suit in which i had travelled was gone and also my overcoat and rug i could find no trace of them anywhere this looked like some new scheme of villainy seventeen june this morning as i was sitting on the edge of my bed cudgelling my brains i heard without a cracking of whips and pounding and scraping of horses feet up the rocky path beyond the courtyard with joy i hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great lighter wagons each drawn by eight sturdy horses and at the head of each pair a slovak with his wide hat great nail-studded belt dirty sheepskin and high boots they had also their long staves in hand i ran to the door intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall as i thought that way might be opened for them again a shock my door was fastened on the outside then i ran to the window and cried to them they looked up at me stupidly and pointed but just then the hetman of the sagani came out and seeing them pointing to my window said something at which they laughed henceforth no effort of mine no piteous cry or agonized entreaty would make them even look at me they resolutely turned away the lighter wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope these were evidently empty by the ease with which the slovaks handled them and by their resonance as they were roughly moved when they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard the slovaks were given some money by the sagani and spitting on it for luck lazily each went to his horse's head shortly afterwards i heard the crackling of their whips die away in the distance twenty four june last night the count left me early and locked himself into his own room as soon as i dared i ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window which opened south i thought i would watch for the count for there is something going on the sagani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing work of some kind 
I know it, for now and then I hear a far away muffled sound, as of mattock and spade, and whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour, when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully, and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst travelling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. This, then, is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me, as they think so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall by the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law which is even a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled round and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up, a low, piteous howling of dogs, somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to wake to some call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into the mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered, till they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started, broad awake, and in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes, which were becoming gradually materialized from the moonbeams, were those three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled, and felt somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me. With a beating heart I tried the door, but I was locked in my prison and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. As I sat I heard a sound in the courtyard without, the agonized cry of a woman. I rushed to the window, and throwing it up, peered between the bars. There, indeed, was a woman with dishevelled hair, holding her hands over her heart, as one distressed with running. She was leaning against the corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward, and shouted in a voice laden with menace, "'Monster! Give me my child!' She threw herself on her knees, and, raising up her hands, cried the same words in tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair and beat her breast, and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally she threw herself forward, and, though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh, metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes had passed a pack of them poured, like a pent-up dam when liberated, 
through the wide entrance into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thing of night, gloom, and fear? 25. June No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and dear to his heart and I the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort, whilst the courage of day is upon me. Last night one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. Action! It has always been at night-time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake, that he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room, but there is no possible way. The door is always locked, no way for me. Yes, there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should I not imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst it can only be death, and a man's death is not a calf's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Good-bye, Mina, if I fail. Good-bye, my faithful friend and second father. Good-bye, all, and last of all, Mina. Same day, later, I've made the effort, and, God helping me, have come safely back to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh, straight to the window on the south side, and at once got outside on this side. The stones are big and roughly cut, and the mortar has by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once, so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful depth would not overcome me, but after that kept my eyes away from it. I know pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window, and made for it as well as I could having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy. I suppose I was too excited, and the time seemed ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the window-sill and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation, however, when I bent down and slid, feet foremost, in through the window. Then I looked around for the Count, but with surprise and gladness made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished, with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms, and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold in one corner, gold of all kinds, Roman and British and Austrian and Hungarian, and Greek, and Turkish money, covered with a film of dust, as though it had lain long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than three hundred years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jewelled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it, for, since I could not find the key of the room, or the key of the outer door which was the main object of my search, 
I must make further examination, or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open, and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only lit by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom there was a dark, tunnel-like passage, through which came a deathly, sickly odour, the odour of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. At last I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar, and found myself in an old ruined chapel which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. There was nobody about, and I made a search over every inch of the ground so as not to lose a chance. I went down even into the vaults, where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep. I could not say which, for eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death, and the cheeks had the warmth of life, though all their pallor. The lips were as red as ever, but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there long, for the earthy smell would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him, and when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled from the place, and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall. Regaining my room, I threw myself panting upon the bed, and tried to think. 29. June Today is the date of my last letter, and the Count has taken steps to prove that it was genuine, for, again, I saw him leave the castle by the same window, and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon that I might destroy him. But I fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him. I dared not wait to see him return, for I feared to see those weird sisters. I came back to the library and read there till I fell asleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man could look, as he said, "'Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England, I to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey.' In the morning come the Sagani, who have some labours of their own here, and also some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you, and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass, to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him, and determined to test his sincerity. Sincerity! It seems like a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster, so I asked him point-blank, Why may I not go to-night? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled, 
such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile that I knew there was some trick behind his smoothness. He said, And your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said, with a sweet courtesy which made me rub my eyes, it seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart, for its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will, though sad I am at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come! With a stately gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seems to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment he proceeded, in his stately way, to the door, drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously I looked all round, but could see no key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the walls without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws with champing teeth and their blunt-clawed feet as they leaped came in through the opening door. I knew that to struggle at the moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command I could do nothing. But still the door continued slowly to open, and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea great enough for the Count, and as the last chance I cried out, Shut the door! I shall wait till morning! And I covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence we returned to the library, and after a moment or two I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me, with a red light of triumph in his eyes, and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of, when I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened, and lest my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back! Back to your own place! Your time is not yet come. Wait! Have patience! Tonight is mine! Tomorrow night is yours! There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter and in a rage I threw open the door, and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh, and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. It is then so near the end? Tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord help me, and those to whom I am dear. 30 June these may be the last words I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I woke I threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came he should find me ready. At last I felt the subtle change in the air, and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cock-crow, and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart I opened the door, and ran down the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains and threw back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door, and shook it till, 
massive as it was, it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the Count. Then a wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk, and I determined, then and there, to scale the wall again and gain the Count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down a wall, as before, into the Count's room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner, and down the winding stair, and along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, but the lid was laid on it, not fastened down, but with the nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall, and then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half restored, for the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron-gray. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby-red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran down over the chin and neck. Even the deep, burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature were simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contact, but I had to search, or I was lost. The coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar war to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the Count. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where, perhaps, for centuries to come, he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood, and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand but I seized a shovel which the workmen had been using to fill the cases, and, lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hands across the box, and as I pulled it away the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and, and fixed with a grin of malice which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought what should be my next move, but my brain seemed on fire, and I waited with a despairing feeling growing over me. As I waited I heard in the distance a gypsy song, sung by merry voices, coming closer, and through their song the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. The Sagani and the Slovaks of whom the Count had spoken were coming. With a last look around and at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained the Count's room, determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened. With strained ears I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of the key in the great lock and the falling back of the heavy door.
there must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked doors. Then there came the sound of many feet tramping and dying away in some passage which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, where I might find the new entrance, but at the moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that sent the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing round me more closely. As I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet and the crash of weights being set down heavily, doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There was a sound of hammering. It is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping again along the hall, with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut. The chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdrawn. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hark! In the courtyard and down past the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips, and the chorus of the Sagani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those horrible women. For Mina is a woman, and there is naught in common. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall farther than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may find a way from this dreadful place, and then away for home, away to the quickest and nearest train, away from the cursed spot, from this cursed land, where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than that of those monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At its foot a man may sleep, as a man. Goodbye, all. Mina. Chapter 5 Read by Elizabeth Clett Ariel Lipshaw Dennis Sayers Eric Sutherland Brett W. Downey Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra Ninth of May My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you, and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately, because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practising shorthand very assiduously. When we are married I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough I can take down what he wants to say in this way, and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practising very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sundays squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day if there is anything in it worth sharing, but it really is an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists doing, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that, with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well, and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all of his news. It must be nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we—I mean Jonathan and I—shall ever see them together. Oh, there is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Good-bye. Your loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours, 
and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter Lucy Westenraugh to Mina Murray 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a great deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mamma get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent parti, being handsome, well off, and of good birth. He is a doctor, and really clever. Just fancy! He is only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study, and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you have never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There, it is all out, Mina. We have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together, and eaten together, and laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire undressing as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. May 24th. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today, not a real proposal, and today I had three. Just fancy! Three proposals in one day! Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals! But for goodness sake don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas, and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from every one except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything. Don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with the strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, 
but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things, and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool, and then when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry he said he was a brute, and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off, and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head his hands trembled, and then with some hesitation he asked me if I cared already for any one else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was some one. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow, whom you know loves you honestly, going away and looking all broken-hearted, and to know that, no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow, an American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh that it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places and has such adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any, and yet— My dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helping him all I could, I am not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang, that is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me, and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his, and said ever so sweetly, "'Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixins of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit.' Won't you just hitch up alongside of me, and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness?" Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly, that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching, and that I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so, on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it, that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always, and never earnest because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped, and said with a sort of manly fervour, that I could have loved him for if I had been free. Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know, 
I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you clean grit, right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there any one else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears, I am afraid, my dear. You will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one, and I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, and save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I am glad to say that though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him out straight, Yes, there is some one I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine, I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, "'That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more selfish anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like, for that other good fellow, or you could not love him hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he's so sad, so I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I am afraid I was blushing very much, he said, "'Little girl, I hold your hand, and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and good-bye.' He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear, or a quiver, or a pause, and I am crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy, when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once, after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Good-bye. Dr. Seward's Diary Kept in Phonograph 25 May Ebb tide in appetite today. Cannot eat. Cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it, there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seemed to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience, as I would the mouth of hell. Memorandum. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Rome finalia sunt. Hell has its price. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards, accurately, 
so I had better commence to do so, therefore. R. M. Rinfield, age fifty-nine, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea, which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself, and the disturbing influence, end in a mentally accomplished finish, a possibly dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armor for their foes as for themselves. What I think on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident, or a series of accidents, can balance it. Letter Quincy P. Morris to Honorable Arthur Holmwood, 25th of May My dear Art, we've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas, and drunk healths at the shores of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world who has won the noblest heart that God has made and best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep into a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours. As ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris, 26 May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Art. Chapter 6 Read by Elizabeth Clett Denny Sayre Mina Murray's Journal 24th July, Whitby Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across, with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This to my mind is the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town, and has a full view of the harbour, and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour, that part of the bank has fallen away, and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the standy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them, through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view, and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee, and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit here and talk. The harbour lies below me, 
with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea-wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea-wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end, too, has a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk, running between banks of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy, with a bell, which swings in bad weather, and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here, that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old for his face is gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said, very brusquely, "'I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I don't say they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time.' They be all very well for commers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet would creed out. I wonder, Marcel, who'd be bothering telling lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale-fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin, when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up, and said, "'I must gang again words home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to crammle aboon the grease, for there be a many of em, and, miss, I lack belly-timber sairly by the clock.' He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them, I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out, visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. 1st August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend, and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes his silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it, and put it all down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock, and barrel. That's what it be, and no else. These bands and wafts and bogusts and barguests and bogles and all anent them is only fit to set bairns and dizzy women a belderin. They be nought but air blebs. They and all grims and signs and warrens be all invented by persons and illsome burke bodies and railway touters to skeer and scunner halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printing lies and paper and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here, all round you, and what e'er you wilt. All them steens, holding up their heads as well as they can out of their pride, is a cant, simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them. And yet in nigh half of them there bain't no bodies at all and the memories of them bain't care to pinch a snuff about, much less sacred. 
Lies, all of them. Nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, but it'll be a quare scroderment at the day of judgment, when they come tumblin' up in their death sarks, all juped together and tryin' to drag their tomb steams with them to prove how good they was, some of them trimlin' and ditherin' with their hands that dozened and slippery from lyin' in the sea, that they can't even keep their girp o' them." I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air, and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies, that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins! There may be a poorish few not wrong, savin' where they make out the people too good, for there be folk that do think a balm-bowl be like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here a stranger, and you see this Kirkgarth." I nodded, for I thought it better to assent though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church." He went on, "'And you con say that all these steens be aboon folk that hapt be here, snod and snog?' I assented again. "'Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay bed that be tomb as old Dunn's back-a-box on Friday night.' He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. "'And my gog! How could they be otherwise? Look at that one, the after sabaft the beer bank, read it. I went over and read Edward Spencelag, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April, eighteen fifty four, age thirty. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to hap him here? Murdered off the coast of Andres, and you consated his body lay under. Why, I could name ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above," he pointed northwards, or where the currents may have drifted them. There be the steens round ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in twenty, or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas in 1777, or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later, or old John Rawlings whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have me anthrums about it. I tell you that when they got here they'd be jommelin' and jostlin' one another in the way that it'd be out like a fight on the ice in the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, and tryin' to tie up our cuts by the aurora borealis." This was evidently local pleasantry for the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, said I, surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the day of judgment. Do you think that will really be necessary? Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose? This, he said with intense scorn, how will it please their relatives to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies?" He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested close to the edge of the cliff. "'Read the lies on that rough stone,' he said. The letters were upside down to me where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read. Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection, on July twenty ninth, eighteen seventy three, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see aught funny, ha <laughs> ha! But that's because you don't go on the sorrowin' mother was a hell-cat that hated him, because he was a screwed, a regular lamater he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide, in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that I had for scarin' crows with. Twarn't for crows then, for it brought the clegs and the dopes to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection. I've often heard him say Massel that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that Steen at any rate?" 
he hammered it with his stick as he spoke, "'a pack o' lies! And won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes panting out the grease, with the top steam balanced on his hump, and asked to be took as evidence?' I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up, "'Oh, why did you tell us any of this? It is my favourite seat, and I cannot leave it, and now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide.' "'That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sittin' on his lap. That won't hurt you. Why, I've sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't you fash about them as lies under you, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for you to be gettin' scart when you see the tombsteens all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble-field. Ah, oh, there's the clock, and I must gang. My service to you, ladies.' and off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me over all again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heart-sick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of donkeys' hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time and farther along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 June The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment, and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, That would do. I must watch him. 18 June He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside to his room. 1. July His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must some of them, at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultantly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was 
very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, and then the totals added in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8 July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious cerebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remained as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets, and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies, by tempting them with his food. 19 July we are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice little sleek playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size, in vivacity, but I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh, yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head, and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden, fierce, sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving, and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again, and found him sitting in a corner, brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me, and implored me to let him have a cat that his salvation depended on it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat down, gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning, early. 20 July. Visited Rinfield very early before attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, 
and, not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied, without turning round, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to see me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took them and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocket-book to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory is proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a zoophagous, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worth while to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally. How well the man reasoned! Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it shall be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good, unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal 26th July. I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy, and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. 
I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleep-walkers always go out on roofs of houses, and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened, or fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear! She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, and that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn and she is already planning out her dresses, and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathise with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat in the churchyard cliff, and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him. Though why I should, I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold. But still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose-pink. She has lost the anaemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3rd August. Another week has gone by, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill! He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him. And yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week. But there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th August. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last week was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun as I write is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it, grey earthy rock grey clouds, tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand-points stretch like grey figures. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea-mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All vastness, the clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some passage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing-boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the ground-swell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss." I could see he was not at his ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, 
I am afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I have been saying about the dead, and such like, for weeks past, but I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I am gone. We old folks that be daffled, and with one foot abaft the crook-hole, don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But, Lord love you, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit, only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand, no, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect, and I'm so nigh it that a old man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin' about it all at once. The chafts will wag as they be used to. Some day soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't you do all and greet, me dearie?" For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waitin' for something else than what we're doin', and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's comin' to me, my dearie, and comin' quick. It may be comin' while we be lookin' and wonderin'. Maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringin' with it loss and wreck, and sore distress and sad hearts. Look! Look! he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the house beyond that sounds, and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it comin'. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes!" He held up his arms devoutly, and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said good-bye, and hobbled off. It all touched me, and upset me very much. I was glad when the coast-guard came along, with his spy-glass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. "'I can't make her out,' he said. "'She's a Russian, by the look of her. But she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open, or to put in here. Look there again! She is steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel, changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time to-morrow. Chapter 7 Read by Kara Schallenberg Chuck Burke Elizabeth Clett Cutting from The Daily Graph 8 August Pasted in Mina Murray's Journal From a Correspondent Whitby One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holiday-makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rigmill, Runswick, Staithes, and the various trips in the neighbourhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from the commanding eminence watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which in barometrical language is ranked number two, light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the East Cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset colour, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm 
we'll grace the R.A. and R.I. walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually hug the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in the face of her danger. Before the night shut down she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of a sheep inland or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White crested waves beat madly on the level sands, and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spumes swept the lanterns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour. The wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea-fog came drifting inland. White, wet clouds, which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold, that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea-mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which came thick and fast, followed by such peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high, threw skywards with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing-boat, with a rag of sail, running madly for shelter before the blast, now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of on-rushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing-boat, with gunwale under water, rushed into the harbour, able, by the guidance of the sheltering light, to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on the shore, a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale, and was then swept away in its rush. Before long the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, 
apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff, as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and, with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbour. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that, in their troughs, the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old salt, "'She must fetch up somewhere, if it was only in hell.' Then came another rush of sea-fog, greater than any hitherto, a mass of dank mist, which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing, for the roar of the tempest, and the crash of the thunder, and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbour mouth across the east pier, where the shock was expected, and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast, and then Mirabile dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast, with all sail set, and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse, with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on the deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbour, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but, rushing across the harbour, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But, strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and, running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrustines or through-stones, as they call them in Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away, it disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus the coast guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbour, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbour without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict, and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once, as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from the west cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd whom the coast guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seamen whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised, or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, 
tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel, and had dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared, after making examination, that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on, in the Admiralty Court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statues of Mormain, since the tiller, as emblemship, if not proof, of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honourable watch and ward till death a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering backward, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. I shall send, in time for your next issue, further details of the derelict ship, which found her way so miraculously into harbour in the storm. 9. August. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is Russian, from Varna, and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington, of seven, the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and took formal possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship, and paid all harbour dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here to-day except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days' wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of other complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened, and made its way on to the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should in itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant, close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open, as if with a savage claw. Later. By the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the log-book of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was to-day produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold, it has not been my lot to come across. 
as there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a transcript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania, before he had got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken, cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Demeter, Varnet a Whitby. Written 18 July, things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6 July, we finished taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth. At noon, set sail. East wind, fresh. Crew, five hands. Two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On 11 July, at dawn, entered Bosphorus. Boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish! All correct. Underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Dardanelles. More customs officers and flag boat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough but quick. Want us off soon. At dark, passed into archipelago. On 13 July, passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. On 14 July, was somewhat anxious about crew. Men, all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night. Was relieved by Amramov, but did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with them. Feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, Olgarin, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deckhouse as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man who was not like any of the crew come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bows found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I'm afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search the entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men, said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with the handspike. I let him take the helm, while the rest began a thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy with sails, no time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men all in a panic of fear sent a round robin, asking to have double watch as they fear to be alone. Mate angry. Fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men 
will do some violence. 28 July. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom and the wind a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and let men snatch a few hours' sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, but feel them less as ship is steadier. 29 July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth and wait for any sign of cause. 30 July, last night. Rejoiced we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired worn out, slept soundly. Awakened by mate telling me that both man of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 1 August. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he Romanian. 2 August, Midnight Woke up from few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover, as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds he rushed up on deck in his flannels, he looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night I saw it, like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. And as he spoke, he took the knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on. But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hole, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and lantern and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark, raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then... If I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by, and signal for help. It is nearly over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream which made my blood run cold, and up the deck he came, as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. 
Save me! Save me! he cried, and then looked around on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He's there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it's all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, will that ever be? 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I'm a sailor. Why else I know not. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man. To die like a sailor in blue water, no man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, well then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders there is now none to say. The folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names, as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for, with public opinion in its present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. To-morrow we'll see the funeral, and so we'll end this one more Mystery of the Sea. Mina Murray's Journal 8th August Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney-pots it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her, and got her back in bed. It is a very strange thing this sleep-walking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning we both got up and went down to the harbour to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clear and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow, forced themselves in through the mouth of the harbour, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not in the sea last night, but on land. But oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he, and how? I am getting fearfully anxious about him. If I only knew what to do, and could do anything! 10th August. The funeral of the poor sea-captain to-day was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat, whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. 
we had a lovely view, and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest near our seat, so that we stood on it, when the time came, and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause, in that poor Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had, evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man! Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I myself am very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and then angrily. But it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a fury, with its eyes savage, and all its hair bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the war-path. Finally the man too got angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, and then took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing began to tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity, too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is of too supersensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this to-night, I am sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude, tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will all afford material for her dreams. I think it will be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin's Hood Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleep-walking then. CHAPTER Eight. Read by Elizabeth Clett, Kathleen Watt, Robert Barton, Dennis Sayers, Avai, Mina Murray's Journal. Same day, eleven o'clock p.m. Oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I had made my diary a duty, I should not open it to-night. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse, and frightened the wits out of us. I believe we forgot everything, except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean, and give us a fresh start. We had a capital, severe tea at Robin's Hood Bay, in a sweet little old-fashioned inn, with a bow-window right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather many, stoppages to rest, and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired, and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westenra asked him to stay for supper. Lucy and I had both a fight for it with the dusty miller. I know it was a hard fight on my part, and I am quite heroic. I think that some day the bishops must get together and see about breeding up a new class of curates, who don't take supper, no matter how hard they may be pressed to, and who will know when girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more colour in her cheeks than usual, and looks, oh, so sweet! If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her, seeing her only in the drawing-room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new women writers will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing and accepting. 
But I suppose the new woman won't condescend in future to accept. She will do the proposing herself. And a nice job she will make of it, too. There's some consolation in that. I am so happy to-night, because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner, and that we are over her troubles with dreaming. I should be quite happy if I only knew if Jonathan— God bless and keep him. 11th August. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I am too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up, with a horrible sense of fear upon me, and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found that she was not in the room. The door was shut but not locked, as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who has been more than usually ill lately, so threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving the room it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue as to her dreaming intention. Dressing-gown would mean house, dress outside. Dressing-gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself, she cannot be far as she is only in her night-dress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting-room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms of the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the catch of the lock had not caught. The people of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all details. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier I looked across the harbour to the east cliff, in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. There was a bright full moon, with heavy, black, driving clouds, which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing, as the shadow of a cloud obscured St. Mary's Church and all around it. Then, as the cloud passed, I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view, and as the edge of a narrow band of light as sharp as a sword-cut moved along, the church and churchyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favourite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone, and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish-market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came laboured as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something, long and black, bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, "'Lucy! Lucy!' and something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep, and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her, as though she felt the cold. 
I flung the warm shawl over her, and drew the edges tight round her neck, for I had dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all at once. So in order to have my hands free to help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety-pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety and pinched or pricked her with it, for by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and then began very gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once, I shook her forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as of course she did not realise all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time, when her body must have been chilled with cold, and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in a churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little, and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped, and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes, but I would not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that, as we went home, no one, in case we should meet any one, should notice my bare feet. Fortune favoured us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, passing along a street in front of us. But we hid in a door till he had disappeared up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes, or winds, as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time, sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and washed our feet, and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored me not to say a word to any one, even her mother, about her sleep-walking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health, and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and think, too, of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her, and seemed not to have even changed her side. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety-pin hurt her. Indeed, it might have been serious, for the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin, and have transfixed it, for there are two little red points like pin-pricks, and on the band of her night-dress was a drop of blood. When I apologised, and was concerned about it, she laughed and petted me, and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it could not leave a scar, as it is so tiny. Same day, night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear, and the sun bright, and there was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to Mulgrave Woods, Mrs. Weston were driving by the road, and Lucy and I walking by the cliff-path, and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not but feel how absolutely happy it would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there, I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace, and heard some good music by Spore and Mackenzie, and went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been for some time, and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key the same as before, though I do not expect any trouble to-night. 12th August. My expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was wakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke at the dawn and heard the birds chirping out of the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see was even better than on the previous morning. All her old gaiety of manner seemed to have come back, and she came and snuggled in beside me, and told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, 
and then she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can make them more bearable. 13th August. Another quiet day, and to bed with the key on my wrist as before. Again I woke in the night, and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. It was a brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky, merged together in one great silent mystery, was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, coming and going in great whirling circles. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbour towards the abbey. When I came back from the window, Lucy had lain down again, and was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th August. On the East Cliff, reading and writing all day. Lucy seems to have become as much in love with the spot as I am, and it is hard to get her away from it when it is time to come home for lunch or tea or dinner. This afternoon she made a funny remark. We were coming home for dinner, and had come to the top of the steps up from the west pier, and stopped to look at the view, as we generally do. The setting sun, low down in the sky, was just dropping behind Kettle Ness. The red light was thrown over the east cliff and the old abbey, and seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful rosy glow. We were silent for a while, and suddenly Lucy murmured as if to herself, "'His red eyes again! They are just the same!' It was such an odd expression, coming apropos of nothing, that it quite startled me. I slowed round a little as to see Lucy well without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was in a half-dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out, so I said nothing but followed her eyes. She appeared to be looking over at our own seat, whereon was a dark figure seated alone. I was quite a little startled myself for it seemed for an instant as if the stranger had great eyes like burning flames. But a second look dispelled the illusion. The red sunlight was shining on the windows of St. Mary's Church behind our seat, and as the sun dipped there was just sufficient change in the reflection and refraction to make it appear as if the light moved. I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself with a start, but she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never refer to it, so I said nothing, and we went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache, and went early to bed. I saw her asleep, and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the westward, and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, so bright that, though the front of our part of the crescent was in shadow, everything could be well seen. I threw a glance up at our window, and saw Lucy's head leaning out. I opened my handkerchief and waved it. She did not notice or make any movement whatever. Just then the moonlight crept round an angle of the building, and the light fell on the window. There distinctly was Lucy, with her head lying up against the side of the window-sill, and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep, and by her, seated on the window-sill, was something that looked like a good-sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs, but as I came into the room she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep, and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat, as though to protect it from the cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. She looks so sweet as she sleeps, but she is paler than is her wont and there is a drawn, haggard look under her eyes which I do not like. I fear she is fretting about something. I wish I could find out what it is. 15th August. Rose later than usual. Lucy was languid and tired, and slept on after we had been called. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better, and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is full of quiet joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day she told me the cause. She is grieved to lose Lucy as her very own, but is rejoiced that she is soon to have some one to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady! She confided to me that she has got her death warrant. She has not told Lucy, and has made me promise secrecy. Her doctor told her that within a few months, at most, she must die, for her heart is weakening. At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. 
Ah, oh, we were wise to keep from her the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleep-walking. 17th August. No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker, whilst her mother's hours are numbering to a close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she is doing. She eats well, and sleeps well, and enjoys the fresh air. But all the time the roses in her cheeks are fading, and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I hear her gasping as if for air. I keep the key of our door always fastened to my wrist at night, but she gets up and walks about the room, and sits at the open window. Last night I found her leaning out when I woke up, and when I tried to wake her, I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her, she was as weak as water, and cried silently between long, painful struggles for breath. When I asked her how she came to be at the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety-pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open, and if anything larger than before, and the edges of them are faintly white. They are like little white dots with red centres. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing about them. Letter Samuel F. Billington and Son Solicitors Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Co., London, 17th of August. Dear Sirs, herewith please receive invoice of goods sent by Great Northern Railway. Same are to be delivered at Carfax, near Purfleet, immediately on receipt at goods station King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but enclosed please find keys, all of which are labelled. You will please deposit the boxes, fifty in number, which form the consignment, in the partially ruined building forming part of the house, and marked A on rough diagrams enclosed. Your agent will easily recognise the locality, as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. The goods leave by the train at 9.30 tonight, and will be due at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged by your having teams ready at King's Cross, at the time named, and forthwith conveying the goods to destination. In order to obviate any delays possible, through any routine requirements as to payment in your departments, we enclose cheque herewith for £10, receipt of which please acknowledge. Should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, we shall at once send cheque for difference on hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray, do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business, courtesy, and pressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are, dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Letter, Mrs. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, to Mrs. Billington and Son, Whitby. 21. August Dear Sirs, we beg to acknowledge ten pounds received and to return cheque of one pound seventeen s nine d amount of overplus as shown in receipted accounts herewith goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions and keys left in parcel in main hall as directed we are dear sirs yours respectfully pro carter patterson and company mina murray's journal 18th August. I am happy to-day, and right sitting on the seat in the churchyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well all night, and did not disturb me once. The roses seem coming back already to her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. If she were in any way anaemic I could understand it, but she is not. She is in gay spirits, and full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid reticence seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I needed any reminding, of that night, and that it was here on this very seat I found her asleep. As she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of her boot on the stone slab, and said, "'My poor little feet didn't make much noise then. I dare say poor old Mr. Swales would have told me that it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie.' As she was in such a communicative humour, I asked her if she had dreamt it all that night. Before she answered, that sweet puckered look came into her forehead, which Arthur, 
I call him Arthur from a habit, says he loves, and indeed I don't wonder that he does." Then she went on in a half-dreaming kind of way, as if trying to recall it to herself. I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. I only wanted to be here in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something, I don't know what. I remember, though I suppose I was asleep, passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leapt as I went by, and I leaned over to look at it, and I heard a lot of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs, all howling at once as I went up the steps. Then I had a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset, and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. And then I seemed sinking into deep green water, and there was a singing in my ears, as I have heard there is to drowning men, and then everything seemed passing away from me. My soul seemed to go out from my body, and float about the air. I seemed to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me, and then there was a sort of agonizing feeling, as if I were in an earthquake, and I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you." Then she began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to her breathlessly. I did not quite like it, and thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject. So we drifted on to another subject, and Lucy was like her old self again. When we got home the fresh breeze had braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when she saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. 19th August. Joy! 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 Although not all joy. At last, news of Jonathan! The dear fellow has been ill, that is why he did not write. I am not afraid to think it, or to say it, now that I know. Mr. Hawkins sent me on the letter, and wrote himself, oh, so kindly. I am to leave in the morning and go over to Jonathan, and to help to nurse him, if necessary, and to bring him home. Mr. Hawkins says it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I have cried over the good sister's letter till I can feel it wet against my bosom where it lies. It is of Jonathan, and must be near my heart, for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out, and my luggage ready. I am only taking one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London and keep it till I send for it, for it may be that—I must write no more. I must keep it to say to Jonathan, my husband. The letter that he has seen and touched must comfort me till we meet. Letter, Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray. 12th of August. Dear Madam, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, though progressing well, thanks to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary. He has been under our care for nearly six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love, and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say, with his dutiful respects, that he is sorry for his delay and that all of his work is completed. He will require some few weeks' rest in our sanatorium in the hills, but will then return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him, and that he would like to pay for his staying here, so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, yours, with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. P.S. My patient being asleep, I open this to let you know something more. He has told me all about you, and that you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to you both. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Be careful of him always, that there may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. The traces of such an illness as his do not lightly die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friends, and there was nothing on him, nothing that any one could understand. He came in the train from Klausenberg, and the guard was told by the station master there that he rushed into the station shouting for a ticket for home. Seeing from his violent demeanour that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the furthest station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured that he is well cared for. 
he has won all hearts by his sweetness and gentleness he is truly getting on well and i have no doubt will in a few weeks be all himself but be careful of him for safety's sake there are i pray to god and saint joseph and saint mary many many happy years for you both dr seward's diary nineteen august strange and sudden change in renfield last night about eight o'clock he began to get excited and sniff about as a dog does when setting the attendant was struck by his manner and knowing my interest in him encouraged him to talk he is usually respectful to the attendant and at times servile but to-night the man tells me he was quite haughty would not condescend to talk with him at all all he would say was i don't want to talk to you you don't count now the master is at hand the attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him if so we must look out for squalls for a strong man with homicidal and religious mania at once might be dangerous the combination is a dreadful one at nine o'clock i visited him myself his attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant in his sublime self-feeling the difference between myself and the attendant seemed to him as nothing it looks like religious mania and he will soon think that he himself is god these infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being how these madmen give themselves away the real god taketh heed lest a sparrow fall but the god created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow oh if men only knew for half an hour or more renfield kept getting excited in greater and greater degree i did not pretend to be watching him but i kept strict observation all the same all at once that shifty look came into his eyes which we always see when a madman has seized an idea and with it the shifty movement of the head and back which asylum attendants come to know so well he became quite quiet and went and sat on the edge of his bed resignedly and looked into space with lacklustre eyes i thought i would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed and tried to lead him to talk of his pets a theme which had never failed to excite his attention at first he made no reply but at length said testily bother them all i don't care a pen about them what i said you don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders spiders at present are his hobby and his notebook is filling up with columns of small figures to this he answered enigmatically the bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride but when the bride draweth nigh then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled he would not explain himself but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time i remained with him i am weary to-night and low in spirits i cannot but think of lucy and how different things might have been if i don't sleep at once chloral the modern morpheus i must be careful not to let it grow into a habit no i shall take none to-night i have thought of lucy and i shall not dishonour her 
by mixing the two. If need be, tonight shall be sleepless. Later. Glad I made the resolution. Gladder that I kept to it. I had lain tossing about, and had heard the clock strike only twice, when the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward, to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes, and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he had seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed, when he looked through the observation trap in the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and had at once sent up for me. He was only in his night gear, and cannot be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He is a bulky man, and couldn't get through the window. I am thin, so with his aid I got out, but feet foremost, and as we were only a few feet above ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left, and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once, told the watchman to get three or four four men immediately and follow me into the grounds of carfax in case our friend might be dangerous i got a ladder myself and crossing the wall dropped down on the other side i could see renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house so i ran after him on the far side of the house i found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently, to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him, and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him, and so ventured to draw nearer to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I heard him say, I'm here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar, anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes, even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now, at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat 
that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are, at times, awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I shall be patient, master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint, and came to. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. Chapter 9 Read by Elizabeth Clatt Ariel Lipshaw, Dennis Sayers, Brett W. Downey, Robert Smith. Letter, Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Budapest, 24th August. My dearest Lucy, I know you'll be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station at Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to Hull all right, and caught the boat to Hamburg, and then the train on here. I feel that I can hardly recall anything of the journey, except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan, and that as I should have to do some nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. All the resolution has gone out of his dear eyes, and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face has vanished. He is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least he wants me to believe so and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he wanted her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself, and say she would never tell. That the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, and that if a nurse through her vocation should hear them, she should respect her trust. She is a sweet good soul, and the next day when she saw I was troubled, she opened up on the subject my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he has done wrong himself, and you as his wife-to-be have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you, or what he owes to you. His fear was of great and terrible things which no mortal can treat of. I do believe the dear soul thought I might be jealous, lest my poor dear should have fallen in love with another girl. The idea of my being jealous about Jonathan! And yet, my dear, let me whisper. I felt a thrill of joy through me when I knew that no other woman was a cause for trouble. I am now sitting by his bedside, where I can see his face while he sleeps. He is waking. When he woke he asked me for his coat, as he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought all his things. I saw amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew that I might find some clue to his trouble but I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window, saying he wanted to be quite alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina. I knew then that he was in deadly earnest, for he has never called me by that name since he asked me to marry him. You know, dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is, I feel my head spin round, and I do not know if it was real, or the dreaming of a madman. You know I had brain fever, and that is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here with our marriage. For, my dear, we had decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know unless indeed some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back, exhausted, and I put the book under his pillow, and kissed him. I have asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and am waiting her reply. She has come and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon after as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour, and was all ready, and he sat up in bed, propped up with pillows. 
He answered his, I will, firmly and strong. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even those words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please, God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibilities I have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding present, when the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband. Oh, Lucy, it is the first time I have written the words, My Husband! Left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow, and wrapped it up in white paper, and tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was around my neck, and sealed it over the knot with sealing wax and for my seal I used my wedding-ring. Then I kissed it and showed it to my husband, and told him that I would keep it so, and then it would be an outward and visible sign for us all our lives that we trusted each other, that I would never open it unless it was for his own dear sake, or for the sake of some stern duty. Then he took my hand in his, and, oh, Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand, and said that it was the dearest thing in all the wide world and that he would go through all the past again to win it, if need be. The poor dear meant to have said a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet, and I shall not wonder if at first he mixes up not only the month, but the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, and that I had nothing to give him except myself, my life, and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And, my dear, when he kissed me, and drew me to him with his poor weak hands, it seemed like a solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? It is not only because it is all sweet to me, but because you have been, and are, very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide when you came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. I want you to see now, and with the eyes of a very happy wife, whither duty has led me, so that in your own married life you too may be all happy, as I am. My dear, please, almighty God, your life may be all it promises, a long day of sunshine, with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be, but I do hope you'll be always as happy as I am now. Good-bye, my dear. I shall post this at once, and perhaps write to you very soon again. I must stop, for Jonathan is waking. I must attend my husband. Your ever-loving, Mina Harker. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Harker. Whitby, 30th of August. My dearest Mina, oceans of love and millions of kisses, and may you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you were coming home soon enough to stay with us here. The strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It has quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, am full of life, and sleep well. You will be glad to know that I have quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week, that is, when I once got into it at night. Arthur says I am getting fat. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides, and rowing and tennis and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that for at first he told me that he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is nonsense. There he is calling to me, so no more just at present from your loving Lucy. P.S. Mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on the 28th of September. Dr. Seward's Diary 20 August The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He has now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack, he was perpetually violent. Then, one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself, Now I can wait. Now I can wait. The attendant came to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat and in the padded room, but the suffused look had gone from his face, and his eyes had something of their old pleading, I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition, and directed him to be relieved. 
the attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humour enough to see their distrust, for coming close to me, he said, in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, they think I could hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing, somehow, to the feelings to find myself disassociated, even in the mind of this poor madman, from the others. But, all the same, I do not follow his thought. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, to stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him? I must find out later on. To-night he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten, or even a full-grown cat, will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now, and I can wait. I can wait. After a while I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn, and then that he began to get uneasy, and at length violent, until at last he fell into a paroxysm, which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened, violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunrise. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there was some influence which came and went. Happy thought. We shall to-night play sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. To-night he shall escape with it. We shall give him a chance, and have the men ready to follow, in case they are required. 23 August Quote, The expected always happens. Close quote. How well Disraeli knew life! Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly, so all our subtle arrangements were for naught. At any rate, we have proved one thing, that the spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. I have given orders to the night attendant merely to shut him in the padded room, when once he is quiet, until the hour before sunrise. The poor soul's body will enjoy the relief, even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark! The unexpected again! I am called! The patient has once more escaped! Later. Another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again he went into the grounds of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me he became furious and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then as suddenly grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing, as it looked into the moonlight sky, except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel about, but this one seemed to go straight on, as if it knew where it was bound for, or had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant, 
and presently said, "'You needn't tie me. I shall go quietly.' Without trouble we came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm, and shall not forget this night. Lucy Westenra's Diary Hillingham, 24th of August I must imitate Mina and keep writing things down. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish she were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air, or getting home again. It is all dark and horrid to me, for I can remember nothing. But I am full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch he looked quite grieved when he saw me, and I hadn't the spirit to try to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse to try. 25th of August. Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself, and doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake, and succeeded for a while. But when the clock struck twelve it waked me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, and as I remember no more I suppose I must have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't seem to be getting air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable to see me so. Letter. Arthur to Dr. Seward. Albemarle Hotel, 31 August. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favor. Lucy is ill, that is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there is any cause. I not dare to ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Westenra has confided to me that her doom is spoken. Disease of the heart though poor Lucy does not know it yet. I am sure that there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I am almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, old fellow, she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask or you to act. You are to come at lunch at Hillingham tomorrow, two o'clock, so as not to arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Westenra. And, after lunch, Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I am filled with anxiety, and want to consult with you alone as soon as I can, after you have seen her. Do not fail. Arthur. Telegram. Arthur Holmwood to Seward. 1 September. Am summoned to see my father, who is worse. Am writing. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring. Wire me, if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Holmwood. 2 September. My dear old fellow, With regard to Miss Westenra's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course, you must bear in mind that I did not have full opportunity of examination, such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty, which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I had better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you to draw, in a measure, your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done, and propose doing. I found Miss Westenra in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and in a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, 
we got, as some kind of reward for our labours, some real cheerfulness amongst us. Then Mrs. Westenra went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and, till we got there, her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once, and settled that matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but for him. So I am quite free. I could easily see that she was somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemic signs, and, by the chance, I was able to test the actual quality of her blood, for in opening a window which was stiff, a cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly with broken glass. It was a slight matter in itself, but it gave me an evident chance, and I secured a few drops of the blood and have analyzed them. The qualitative analysis give a quite normal condition, and shows, I should infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters, I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety, but as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty breathing satisfactorily at times, and of heavy, lethargic sleep, with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can remember nothing. She says that as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and that when in Whitby the habit came back, and that once she walked out in the night and went to East Cliff, where Miss Murray found her, but she assures me that, of late, the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor von Hilsing, of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things were to be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are, and your relations to Miss Wistenra. This, my dear fellow, is in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Hilsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason, so no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man. This is because he knows what he is talking about better than anyone else. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day. And he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of the ice brook and indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues to blessings, and the kindliest and truest heart that beats. These form his equipment for the noble work that he is doing for mankind, work both in theory and practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I have asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Westenra tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the stores, so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. 
Yours always, John Seward. Letter Abraham Van Helsing, M.D., D.P.H., D.L.I.T., etc., etc., to Dr. Seward. 2. September My good friend, when I received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave just at once without wrong to any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other than it were bad for those who have trusted, for I come to my friend when he call me to aid those he holds dear. Tell your friend that when that time you suck from my wound so swiftly, the poison of the gangrene from that knife that our other friend, too nervous, let slip, you did more for him when he wants my aids, and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. But it is pleasure added to do for him, your friend. It is to you that I come. Have near at hand, and please it so arrange, that we may see the young lady not too late on to-morrow, for it is likely that I may have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if it must. Till then, good-bye, my friend John. Van Helsing. Letter Dr. Seward to Honorable Arthur Holmwood 3. September My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham, and found that, by Lucy's discretion, her mother was lunching out, so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me, and I shall advise you, for of course I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship, and how you trust to me in the matter, he said, You must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will. Nay, I am not jesting. This is no jest, but life and death, perhaps more. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when we had come back to town, and he was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me any further clue. You must not be angry with me, Art, because his very reticence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, to be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit just as if I were doing a descriptive special article for the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts of London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report to-morrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit... Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She had lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Van Helsing saw it too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy brows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things, except ourselves and diseases, and with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense of animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit, and suavely said, My dear young miss, I have the so great pleasure, because you are so much beloved. That is much, my dear, even were there that which I do not see. They told me you were down in the spirit, and that you were of a ghastly pale. To them I say, Poof! and he snapped his fingers at me, and went on. But you and I shall show them how wrong they are, 
how can he and he pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that with which he pointed me out in his class on or rather after a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of how can he know anything of a young lady he has his madmen to play with and to bring them back to happiness and to those that love them it is much to do and oh but there are rewards in that we can bestow such happiness but the young ladies he has no wife nor daughter and the young do not tell themselves to the young but to the old like me who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them so my dear we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden whiles you and i have little talk all to ourselves i took the hint and strolled about and presently the professor came to the window and called me in he looked grave but said i have made careful examination but there is no functional cause with you i agree that there has been much blood lost it has been but is not but the conditions of her are in no way anemic i have asked her to send me her maid that i may ask just one or two questions that so i may not chance to miss nothing i know well what she will say and yet there is cause there is always cause for everything i must go back home and think you must send me the telegram every day and if there be cause i shall come again the disease for not to be well is a disease interest me and the sweet young dear she interest me too she charm me and for her if not for you or disease i come as i tell you he would not say a word more even when we were alone and so now art you know all i know i shall keep stern watch i trust your poor father is rallying it must be a terrible thing to you my dear fellow to be placed in such a position between two people who are both so dear to you i know your idea of duty to your father and you are right to stick to it but if need be i shall send you word to come at once to lucy so do not be over anxious unless you hear from me dr seward's diary for september zoophagus patient still keeps up our interest in him he had only one outburst and that was yesterday at an unusual time just before the stroke of noon he began to grow restless the attendant knew the symptoms and at once summoned aid fortunately the men came at a run and were just in time for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him in about five minutes however he began to get more quiet and finally sank into a sort of melancholy in which state he has remained up to now the attendant tells me that his screams whilst in the paroxysm were really appalling i found my hands full when i got in attending to some of the other patients who were frightened by him indeed i can quite understand the effect for the sounds disturbed even me though i was some distance away it is now after the dinner hour of the asylum and as yet my patient sits in a corner brooding with a dull sullen woe-begone look in his face which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly i cannot quite understand it later 
another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him, and found him seemingly as happy and contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them, and was keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridges of padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologized for his bad conduct, and asked me in a very humble, cringing way to be led back to his own room, and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to humor him, so he is back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the window sill, and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not now eating them, but putting them into a box, as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue to his thoughts would be of immense help to me. But he would not rise. For a moment or two he looked very sad, and said in a sort of far-away voice, as though saying it rather to himself than to me, All over, all over, he has deserted me, no hope for me now, unless I do it myself. Then, suddenly, turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me, and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be very good for me. And the flies, I said. Yes, the flies like it too, and I like the flies, therefore I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply, and left him as happy a man as, I suppose, any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight. Another change in him. I had been to see Miss Wistenra, whom I found much better, and had just returned, and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yelling. As his room is on this side of the house, I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights and inky shadows, and all the marvellous tints that come on foul clouds, even as on foul water, and to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disk sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him, an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative power lunatics have, for Within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signaled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window and brushed out the crumbs of sugar. Then he took his fly-box and emptied it outside, and threw away the box. Then he shut the window and, crossing over, sat down on his bed. All this surprised me, so I asked him, Are you going to keep flies any more? No, said he, I am sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, or of the cause of his sudden passion. Stop! There may be a clue after all, if we can find why today 
his paroxysms came on at high noon and at sunset can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods which affects certain natures as at times the moon does others we shall see telegram seward london to van helsing amsterdam four september patient still better today telegram seward london to van helsing amsterdam five september patient greatly improved good appetite sleeps naturally good spirits color coming back telegram seward london to van helsing amsterdam six september terrible change for the worse come at once do not lose an hour i hold over telegram to homewood till have seen you